Tonight's program is part of an ongoing series called Contemporary Art in Conversation, where we invite artists to come speak in a public dialogue about their work. And previous conversations have included um, writers and critics and artists who only knew of each other through reading or looking at each other's work. But tonight, we are lucky to be graced by two creative minds who share friendship as well as ideas. In her book of essays titled The Black Interior, poet and scholar Elizabeth Alexander examines black life and creativity freed from stereotype. She writes, the black interior is not an inscrutable zone, nor colonial fantasy. Rather, I see it as an inner space in which black artists have found themselves that go far, far beyond the limited expectations and definitions of what black is, isn't, or should be. This book discusses examples of writers, artists, and poets who excavate this territory in their work, including artist Kara James Marshall, whose series of paintings depicting African-American living rooms is mentioned as a notable presentation of a literal black interior, which serves to critique and transform our ideas about race and class. In addition to her critical writing, Alexander is a poet of critical acclaim who has authored four collections of poetry. Her poems and short stories can be found in the Paris Review, American Poetry Review, Perry Schooner, the Kenyan Review, and the Village Voice. And her most recent publication, American Sublime, is fresh from Grey Wolf Press this month. It's a volume that dives into the long history of black America to reflect on moments both subtle and explosive, private and public, that blur the lines between family history and our collective past. If you don't have it already, they're for sale along with some other of her books and a, a catalog of Carrie James Marshall's work right outside the cinema after the program. Visual artist Carrie James Marshall actively accepts the challenge of representing blackness that Alexander describes. He once stated, I decided that whenever I painted an image of a person, it would always be a black image. And that image wouldn't be a personality as much as it would be an image that spoke directly to the issue of blackness. Provocative, politically charged, and beautiful, his work is steeped not only in an investigation of the black aesthetic, but is highly relevant to art world deliberations over the value of traditional or classical imagery within postmodern aesthetics. His paintings, prints, drawings, collages, and video work represent an embrace of traditional pr principles of art, such as narrative voice, figurative representation, and personal expression, all the while speaking fluently the often ironic language of postmodernism. Marshall's work is on the walls of major American institutions and private collections, including the Art Institute and Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago, the Studio Museum of American Art in New York, the Los Angeles Museum, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, and right here at the Walker Art Center. If you haven't seen it, his, his large-scale painting, Gulf Stream, is on view upstairs in the Medtronic Gallery on the seventh floor. And we are lucky to be witnessing all of this work tonight, poetry, paintings, and conversation from our little intimate interior living room set up over here. Um, before I get started, I do want to mention that this talk is being webcast live this evening. Um, that also means that it will be archived on the Walker channel, which is the section of our website where you can find, um, you, where you can download um, webcasts of previous lectures at any time that you like. And because of this, we ask that you use one of the roving microphones we'll be passing through the audience during the Q&A. So please welcome Elizabeth Alexander and Carrie James Marshall. Thank you all for coming. We decided to do this with my reading some poems first, and then Carrie will show some pictures, and then we will talk together. And so in deciding what to read, I thought I would mostly stick with the new book of poems, American Sublime, and put together a reading for all of you, but a reading for Carrie, uh, of um, poems that um, mark some of our intersections. But before even reading that, I just wanted to start with a short, great poem by Gwendolyn Brooks. One of the things that we share is Chicago. And Gwendolyn Brooks once wrote, if you wanted a poem, you only had to look out of a window. There was material always, walking or running, fighting or screaming or singing on the south side of Chicago, the very place from which Carrie now paints. And this is her poem of DeWitt Williams on his way to Lincoln Cemetery. He was born in Alabama. He was bred in Illinois. He was nothing but a plain black boy 
Swing low, swing low, sweet, sweet chariot, nothing but a plain black boy. Drive him past the pool hall, drive him past the show, blind within his casket, but maybe he will know. Down through 47th Street, underneath the L, and northwest corner prairie that he loved so well. Don't forget the dance halls, Warwick and Savoy, where he picked his women, where he drank his liquid joy. Born in Alabama, bred in Illinois, he was nothing but a plain black boy. Swing low, swing low, sweet, sweet chariot. Nothing but a plain black boy. Gwendolyn Brooks. Now me. <laughs> Emancipation. Corncob constellation. Oyster shell, drawstring pouch, dry bones. Gree gree in the rafters, hoodoo in the sleeping nook, mojo in Linda Brent's crawl space. 19th century corncob cosmogram set on the dirt floor beneath the slant roof, left intact the afternoon that someone came and told those slaves, we're free. Smile. When I see a black man smiling like that, nodding and smiling with both hands visible, mouthing, yes, officer, across the street. I think of my father who taught us the words cooperate, officer, to memorize badge numbers, who has seen black men shot at from behind in the warm months north. And I think of the fine line, hairline, eyelash, fingernail pairing, the whisper that separates obsequious from safe. Armstrong, Johnson, Robinson, Mays. A woman with a yellow head of cotton candy hair stumbles out of a bar at after lunchtime, clutching a black man's arm as if for her life. And the brother smiles, and his eyes are flint as he watches all sides of the street. When in the early 1980s, the black men were divine, spoke French, had read everything, made filet mignon with green peppercorn sauce, listened artfully to boyfriend troubles, operatically declaimed boyfriend troubles, had been to Bamako and Bahia, knew how to clear bad humors from a house, had been to Baldwin's villa in St. Paul, drank espresso with Soyenka and Senghor, kissed hello on both cheeks, quoted Baraka's black art, fuck poems, and they are useful, tore up the disco dance floor, were gold lit, photographed well, did not smoke, said chow. Then all the men's faces were spotted. Krishna denies eating mud. Blue boy, the apple of his mother's ravening eye. Blue as the noon sky, blue as the sea, beautiful Krishna, come to me. The boy eats rocks, eats nails, great fistfuls of mud. Mother pries the bud mouth open and looks inside. A globe, planets, oceans, telescopes, Milky Way, books, beasts, flowers, vegetables, minutes, time, history, the universe in Krishna's mouth. Mother faints, astonished. Krishna, you will remember none of this. Mother awakening. Angel, blue angel, come sit on my lap. Come sit on my starry skirt. Black poets talk about the dead. Like Tony, he said, who came plain as day to my dream last night in a gangster beret, tangerine-colored suit, thigh-high go-go boots. She tipped that brim and said, how you like me now? After Etheridge passed, I went to see his woman with my daughter, who was six at the time and had loved him. 
We slept in the room where he'd slept, and in the night, my child woke up and said, I was talking to Etheridge just now. Can't you smell his cigarettes? After she left us, we felt mom close. She had passed, but not crossed. And those were good weeks. Her soup in the freezer, perfume in her handkerchiefs, half empty cups of her tea grown cold. But bit by bit, she left and then was gone. They do that so we can mourn. They do that so we believe it. It is what it is, wretched work, that we who the dead leave behind must do. Ars Poetica number 17, first Afro-American Esperantist. Gumbo, yaya, lingua franca, truffle or frango. Epic, Afrolatia. O oh, language, my trinket, my dialect bucket, my bracelet of flesh. Certificate, Esperantist, heirloom trunk, then Beinecke. X-ray, communicado, acid free. Ars Poetica number 28, African leave taking disorder. The talk is good. The two friends linger at the door. Urban crickets sing with them. There is no after the supper and talk. The talk is good. These two friends linger at the door, half in, half out, till one decides to walk the other home. And so they walk. More talk. The new doorstep. The nightgowned wife who shakes her head and smiles from the bedroom window as the men talk in love and the crickets sing along. The joke would be if the one now home walked the other one home, where they started, to keep talking and so on, African leave-taking disorder, which names her children everywhere, trying to come back together and talk. Ars Poetica number 23, what's up, G? From the Latin negrorum, meaning to tote, said Richard Pryor in an etymological mode. Look it up in Cab Calloway's Hepster's Dictionary, that giant book. Be Negro, be Groid, be Vernacular, be. Hey yo, hey bro, hey blood, high five, big ups, give me some skin, keep it on the QT, the down low, the real side. What it is, what it looked like. Vernacular, Verna, a houseborn slave. Ask your mama what it means. Old school lying and signifying, that chick has a chemical deficiency, no acetal. And who knows, on the radio, what evil lurks in the hearts of men. The shadow do, quoth the brethren, and fall out, cackalacking and slapping, high top fade to black. Ars Poetica number 88, sublime. In a pickle, we talk our way out of our corners. We can the rough stuff. Overture, theme and variation, call and response, I equals we. Girl could talk. Sweet or savory, nutmeg or cinnamon, jalapeno or scotch bonnet, maraschino, cherry or angostura bitters. Sing, your mouth an O which bubbles tra-la-la or reaches low to where nobody knows what a baby knows, the word as light, the word as vowel, the word as element, the need to sing. American Sublime. At the same time, American paintings wherein the biodynamic landscape explodes in flames, ice, violent sunshine that seems to burn the canvas, apocalyptic nature that roils and terrifies. The beautiful, small-scale, gentle luminosity. Sublime, territorial, vast, craggy, undomesticated, borderless, immense, unknown, awful, monumental, transcendent, transcending. 
Go west and west, young man, to blinding snowstorms. Leave shark-infested waters, shipwrecks without slaves. Miraculous black holes of color, large enough to blot out the sun, obliterate the unending moans, to exalt, to take the place of lamentation. And to close these poems, Tanner's Annunciation. Gabriel disembodied, pure column of light. Humble Mary, receiving the word that the baby she carries is God's. Not good news, not news even, but rather the rightly enormous word, annunciation. She knew they were chosen. She knew he would suffer as the chosen child always suffers. Perhaps she knew the dearest wish, mercy, would be ever inchoate, like Gabriel. Light that carries possibility, illuminates, but that can promise nothing but itself. And now Carrie will show slides. Thank you. I think I'm going to show most of these slides without a lot of comment. Um, so we can kind of pick up in the dialogue later some of the background uh, that might help to kind of flesh out what some of these pictures are trying to do. Uh, but the, the first thing I, I think I would say is just for me is that it's always really uh, Let's see, uh, it's both refreshing and also really kind of uh, exciting to see how many places the work of, not my work and, and Elizabeth's work sort of overlaps. Uh, I mean, the thematics that run through all of our works uh, are tied to a thread that I think you will discover in the works of large sort of parts of the African-American creative community. And it's always really sort of refreshing to hear these echoes of things that concern you and that you've been sort of invested in uh, for so long and that it's so meaningful uh, to hear those echoes sort of reverberating in the work of, of other, other artists. Because it just, it reminds you again, you know, as we often need to be reminded again and again and again, that we are not alone. <laughs> so we're not in this, in this sort of by ourselves. Um, and so that's, that's good. <clears throat> uh, so anyway, I'm gonna, I, I got a whole lot of slides in there, <laughs> you know, which is sort of uh, um, <clears throat> symptomatic of my own inability <laughs> you know, to kind of edit um, <laughs> and be as sort of uh, tight and terse as poets <laughs> often are. <laughs> um, but anyway, I, I'll, these, these pictures sort of tell a kind of a story, you know, and it's, it's uh, hopefully it, it's a, a story that has a kind of developmental momentum about it where you can see that it's coming from somewhere and going someplace else. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with, uh, oh, I gotta point this thing. Uh, I'm gonna start with a seminal picture. This was, this was a pivotal picture. Uh, for me, and uh, for uh, for a lot of reasons, you know, one is one is that it, it's this is one of the first uh, pictures that really had a very direct connection to a literary source for me. <clears throat> but it's also really important because it's also the first picture in which I felt like I had completely synthesized all of the kind of uh, information I'd been gleaning from looking at and studying and analyzing uh, classical Renaissance painting. So, and in it, it, it does all these things that, that you could hear in, uh, in some of Elizabeth's poems where you move from the kind of formal, from the vernacular to the formal and then back again. And so for me, there was, I had, um, this is, and this is a self-portrait on some, in some ways. It's called The Portrait of the Artist as a Shadow of His Former Self. 
Um, and it, it trades on, I mean, I, it's like the, the poem Smile, you know, which was sort of meaningful, but it trades on a, 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 a history and tradition of vernacular representations of black figures. Um, but it tries to extend the, the, um, the authority of that vernacular figure by by having, it, having this picture be sort of self-consciously constructed on, a, on the similar kind of framework that, say, Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci would have organized the picture they were making. And so what seems to be really simple on the surface actually has a much more complicated framework underneath. And the sort of self-consciousness comes in the way that the thing is sort of very carefully and, and consciously constructed, where the position of everything is sort of marked because it's supposed to have a particular function. Uh, in terms of the way the, the image occupies the space it's in. Uh, but the literary source that was the, the genesis of a picture like this was Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man. And so what I have been, what I have been uh, engaged in for the longest time is trying to find ways to um, uh, present the image of blackness as a rhetorical figure. Um, in context where, in some cases, where it does two things simultaneously. One is both present and absent at the same time. Uh, and so to do that, I used to do a lot of paintings that were done sort of black on black, where you, there's a black figure against the black ground where the difference between the, you could take the color temperature of the black, maybe put a warm black figure against the cool black background, and that temperature change would be a, a sufficient enough uh, difference to make the figure visible and invisible, depending on the angle at which you might be looking at it. And so those, those were really important issues. And Ralph Ellison's, uh, the description of invisibility that Ralph Ellison used uh, as opposed to the description of invisibility as it was defined, described by H.G. Wells, was the condition that black people live under, lived under in the United States, where it wasn't this sort of perceptual, you know, phenomenological sort of uh, invisibility, where you know, when H.G. Uh, Wells' invisible man took off all his clothes, he became tra completely transparent, you couldn't see him. But it was the kind of, it was invisible, it was being fully present, yet being invisible to the sight or to the minds or to the desire of people who you would encounter in the American scene. And so that was the condition that Ralph Ellison described. And that was what led me to start making paintings like that. And that picture that I showed before was the first time I had sort of used this very schematic sort of uh, black figure image uh, in my work. And it started out very flat, but it, over time started to become much more uh, developed in terms of having um, more sort of internal modeling, even though what I'm still trying to do is preserve the essential blackness of the figure in every um, manifestation. So anyway, I'm going to run through a couple of uh, 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 things, and then we'll get to some stuff. Uh, at the most, maybe I'll give you some titles, but I, got, I think I got about 70 slides in there. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, <laughs> who was that? Um, so anyway, uh, I'm, I'm going to run through. So those first two uh, are a part of that group. Uh, but then there's, there are a group of paintings. Uh, what is this? <laughs> All right, that's your walkie-talkie. <laughs> so anyway, uh, but the other way in which you see sort of kind of echoes and overlaps between what I'm doing and what Elizabeth does too is the way in which um, a pantheon of figures from African American history or American history really, but, but narrowly uh, tailored to African Americans, people would call it African American history, uh, who figures sort of keep coming up in the work. And we sort of pay homage to people uh, all often in the work, and these, I did a, couple, a bunch of paintings at one time about Nat Turner, of which this is one. Uh, but in here you sort of see how this collage sensibility that starts to become an important factor in work that I do later on is, is present. But this is an early work, uh, a work uh, based on Nat Turner. Uh, the title, I had, used to have crazy titles, and so this, this was the portrait of Nat Turner on loan from hell. <laughs> 
uh, and you know, people who know the story of Nat Turner, and it's, and then you know the uh, the confessions of Nat Turner that William Styron wrote, you would kind of know what I mean, <laughs> I think. Uh, and then this is <clears throat> another uh, Nat Turner piece called, and this the piece is called "The Face of Nat Turner Appeared in a Water Stain." Um, and so there appears I used to do uh, a lot of work that was sort of found object based and collage based. And then moving back and forth between that collage based work and then the work that was sort of classically sort of interested in kind of classical forms and stuff. <clears throat> but this, these were works that I was doing because, you know, periodically, and, and I don't know if people followed the story in Chicago in the, uh, since last, um, was it just since last Easter, I guess, but there was a new sort of miraculous sighting under the overpass at Fullerton on the Kennedy Expressway where the version of Guadalupe appeared in the runoff from the storm drain <laughs> over the, and so and there's a shrine there uh, now. You know, people have been going there since then, and it's, it's still there. A guy, uh, a Mexican guy actually, <laughs> uh, came over and spray painted the whole thing. Because he said, this is like ridiculous. It's like people coming to site, this is not the version of Guadalupe, this is like some nonsense. So he says, this is foolish. So he came and spray painted it. But then they, the, the people who were sort of monitoring the whole thing came back. They carefully cleaned off all the, the paint and sort of cleaned up the, the image. So it, it's the stain. So it's still there. But anyway, but there were a lot of those kinds of sightings. And periodically, those kinds of things happen. And you have people making pilgrimages to gas stations and stuff where <clears throat> somebody has seen these sort of visions. And so I saw that thing, I said, well, this is like a perfect place for that kind of a miraculous uh, thing to take place. And so that was a water stain on a desk that I found in the back of my, the apartment I was living in in Hyde Park. But anyway, so I've, I'm going to go through some of these. This is called Silence is Golden. And I, I can't hardly tell if those are in focus from where I am, but it looks a little out of focus. Uh, um, but we'll move on. Um, <clears throat> And these little s small paintings that you're sort of icon-like uh, paintings. This is called A Woman with a Heart of Gold. Hey. Uh, Self-explanatory. out of focus. So it's stigma stigmata is what this is called. Uh, and the thing is, like if in a lot of these, these pictures, you see those, those yellow, uh, the images at the top with the yellow around them, which are all, I was using, doing, uh, collaging into a lot of the paintings, images from Harlequin romance novels. So those are all the covers from Harlequin romance novels. And so since the work was in part kind of dealing with ideas of stereotype, archetype, stereotype, and imagery. I mean, those images on the cover of Harlequin romance novels were the white counterpart to the black sort of stereotype of an image, except those were all stereotypes of loveliness <laughs> on Harlequin romance novel covers. <clears throat> um, man, what is it with that focus thing? Um, this is, uh, the title of the painting is in it, so this is what you want. And that image, if you can't tell, is like a uterus, female reproductive system, you know, so it's got a lot of, there's always something, there's a backstory. Uh, um, but since I have so many pictures, I better, I'm going to keep on going. So this is called uh, Supermodel. And so you see how this, this image, I mean, in, in all cases, when I paint these images now, they are painted as jet black figures, um, which allows them to function, I think, at the peak of their power as rhetorical devices in the context of these paintings. So it is blackness embodied, in a sense, in these figures, but with other uh, implications, you know. Uh, <clears throat> and then 
so from the, the paintings and the collages and things, I'm sort of doing simultaneously. And I show these collages sort of in this position because the collages I was making actually began to lead directly to the kinds of paintings that I was going to make later on. I mean, the, the, the bigger paintings that more people were familiar with of mine. And it, a lot of that came from a kind of collage sensibility that extends from Romare Bearden for me, first through Kurt Schwitters, through Joseph Cornell, and through all those people who were, were making collage, through Max Ernst. Uh, but more directly, the Romare Bearden collages you know, and their narrative thrust you know, had a, a really powerful uh, effect on the work I wanted to do. And so there were these kinds of collages. And then there were these kinds of collages. And, and for me, in terms of the kind of another place where a literary source had a profound impact on uh, me making a, a group of works. These works, this one and uh, this work in particular, are part of a group of works that are all entitled At the End of the Wee Hours. And they are at the end of the wee hours because that is the refrain in an epic poem by Aimé Césaire, uh, who's a poet from Martinique. Um, and that poem, when I first encountered it, first read it, I mean, really sort of was miraculous to me. Uh, miraculous in the way that it took an intensely political sort of posture and a subject, but articulated it in such poetic, sort of lyrically poetic terms uh, as to I mean, it just was overwhelming on some level. Um, and it's like, you know, a lot of, I mean, people in general, I would, might say, but for me, I, I hadn't really thought a lot about poetry per se, you know, and, and, and still probably don't read anywhere near as much poetry as I would like to uh, or should. <clears throat> but I noticed that when I do read some poems, uh, they do have a, a powerful effect. And there's something about the intersection between the way imagery is produced by language and the way imagery can be manifest through material that you, you want to try to get some of, in visual imagery, you want to try to get some of that poetics in the kind of imagery you make. And so this was an attempt on my part to be, to evoke a sense of the landscape in the tropics that Aimé Césaire sort of evoked in his poem, but use that in, in visual terms. Uh, but using it visually also tied to another project that had something to do with, and then with my examination of uh, Picasso and Brock and analytic cubist painting. So in which that fragmented picture space they were working with in cubism um, was th the way they emphasized that fragmented picture space by stripping away from the imagery all of the extraneous sort of details, all the, the, the color, the rich detail that sort of uh, in imagery, the realism they sort of took out and essentially abstracted those forms and then took the structure and, and sort of broke it up uh, and arrayed it across the picture plane. And so I, this was a part of a project of mine to say, well, I'm going to put back into that fragmented, take that fragmented picture structure that analytical cubist paintings had, put back in everything they took out, and then try to add narrative, another narrative dimension to it all besides. And so these kinds of collages I was making as a part of that project. Uh, but they were driven by uh, a, a, an attempt to try and achieve the same sort of poetic effect that Amy Césaire had in, in his poem, Notebook of a Return to My Native Land. Um, and I, you, I mean, they're, they're, I won't say any more about that. We'll just move on. <laughs> but anyway, but this collage, I would say at least, <laughs> is directly related to the kinds of paintings I was going to eventually start making later on. Uh, so I went through, you go through phases where you're really using form to try and explore different uh, aspects of visuality and the, the effectiveness or the ability to communicate with, with certain forms. And so I did a lot of abstract collages uh, for a period. I did the, the fragmented things. I did the other earlier narrative stuff. Um, these sort of mixed media. Uh, I, I did those for years, for a couple of years, until I felt like I had learned everything I needed to know about surface, shape, texture, you know, all of that stuff, you know, in this regard. Then I could start figuring out how to use that surface and those, those uh, aspects of 
the, the painting for other purposes, for other things that I wanted to say. Um, so and then I go, these are a series of monoprints that are based on the seven African powers the, in the Yoruba pantheon of deities. And so you see how this sort of African mythology starts to find its way into the subject uh, matter of work that I do. And this was also an improvis improvis improvisational project where was, these are monoprints that are, it's a woodcut and a monoprint where I'd sort of make the, an, a relatively abstract monoprint on a piece of paper and then look at that monoprint and see what kind of wood block could be cut to fit with it and then print the woodcut on top of that once and then just and move on. And I, I did a series of those where I just wanted to see how many variations, how, how far I could go with that project, how many of them I could do before the thing sort of ran out of steam. And this is another one. This would be Obatala. I mean, so they're all sort of symbolically representative of those uh, African powers, but, but they do have some relevance there. This would be Eshu. Uh, and then Oshun. Focus on that. All right, now the speed round. <laughs> anyway, uh, and then so that collage sensibility that I was, that comes out of doing all of those different works that I had done before. So you had the black on black figure, the, the figures of blackness, you had the collages in the sort of pure form, you had the mixed media collages with paint and, and collage, you have the kind of classical picture structure, all of that stuff sort of comes together in this picture. And for me, this was, when I imagined myself being an artist and I looked at my ambition in terms of what I wanted to do, this was the picture I had always been, I had always imagined myself being able to make. And when I finally made that painting, that was when I, as I told the group of younger people earlier, that I reached a plateau and everything changed for me at that point. My whole project sort of changed and is my relationship to what I was doing changed completely. Um, I was more confident in what I was able to do after making that picture than I had ever been before. And it's like, and, and, it's, and that confidence was built on the fact that I knew and understood the language of visual representation well enough to be able to deploy it as needed um, effectively using the, the, the strategies and devices that seem most effective for a given, for a given subject and a, a given kind of picture. And so and this was the painting that sort of marked that. And this was also the painting that kind of marked, uh, that established a relationship between the works that I was doing and what people see is that grand tradition of history painting, that large sort of narrative paintings that were, pre were pop more popular in the 19th century, 18th and 19th century uh, in America but you know, that come out of the old sort of Italian you know, Renaissance sort of period. And so this work sort of operates on the scale is 10 foot by 10 and a half feet. And it's got all of these layers of information in it. It's visually rich in terms of there's sort of a history of painting sort of on the, in, the, in the picture. And it's got that sort of evocation of a kind of uh, trans-African diasporic sort of symbolism underneath, you know. So all of that stuff is kind of happening in there and it's sort of socially relevant. So this was a painting called The Lost Boys uh, and accompanying that painting was a series of uh, portraits that sort of went with it. There were 10 of these that are all sort of small portrait paintings called Lost Boys also. Um, there's a group of those I'm just gonna go through and a couple of little lost girls too. Um, and so they're like a reliquary pictures in a way. They're funerary portraits, funereal. Um, some, uh, and then there's this painting, which is called De Style. And, and for me in terms of, uh, I, I talked a lot about ambition and uh, for me this, that painting, even though the first painting was the one, was the picture that I had always imagined myself being able to make, 
if I was going to be like a, a mature artist. Uh, this painting ended up being the painting that fulfilled my ambition uh, from childhood, which was to find, to, to find a way to get uh, paintings that foregrounded the figures of black people into major mainstream museums at a scale and on a set of terms that were commiserate with things that were already in the museum. Uh, and on a scale so that, because I had, the, even when you found work by African American artists in the museum, the scale they exist, they entered there under was so modest that it made it easy to overlook those works, even, even if they were there. And so I thought, well, I mean, I want to make a work that cannot be denied and that cannot be overlooked. Uh, and so that's why these, these things are so big, uh, like they are, <laughs> you know. So they sort of, they aim at that same scale. I don't know if you've, ever, for the people who've been to the Louvre, you go in there and you see those, <laughs> you know, as a, a friend of mine said, those were the drive-in theaters. The drive-in movies of their time, <laughs> and it's true, because if you if you know the story of uh, Jerry Cole's Wrath of the Medusa, you know it's like he was a producer. He became a millionaire on that one picture. You know that picture traveled around the world, and people paid admission to go see it. So, and that was the same case with a lot of those early American landscape painters with Bierstadt and people like that. When they set those things up, it was an event. You know, people went to. They had binoculars. <laughs> You know, that people could sort of peer into the painting like they were looking into the landscape, for real. <laughs> so it was entertainment <laughs> on a certain level, too. <clears throat> and so, you know, so I was aspiring to be in that league, you know. And this painting was bought by the L.A. County Art Museum, which is the first major museum purchase of a painting of mine. Um, and the L.A. County, it was important because the L.A. County Art Museum was the first art museum I had ever been into. So when I was a kid, that was the one I went on the field trip with my school to the museum. That was the place we went to. And I used to hang out at the L.A. County Art Museum and, sort of, and finally get, having a painting sort of in that collection fulfilled a great ambition of mine. Um, and then at that point, once I had sort of done that, I had done everything I'd set out to do at the time, <laughs> really. Uh, so then I was free to go on to the next set of projects. Um, and. Uh, that next set of projects had more to do with securing not just the place in the institution, in the museum, but then trying to figure out a way to secure a position in history, uh, which I, that's a, on modest levels, I've sort of gotten, <laughs> gotten there. But um, uh, still yet to be, that's still yet to be fulfilled at the level that I want <laughs> to. <laughs> So anyway, I'm going to go through, so, and now I'll speed up a little bit more. I keep saying that, but <laughs> <laughs> never doing it. So anyway, another, you know, Voyager is what this is called. I'm going to, I'm going to roll. <laughs> um, the, a series of paintings called The Garden Project, based on housing projects in Chicago that have garden as part of their name. So this was Stateway Gardens, which is now gone, now demolished, because, you know, this plan for transformation in the, in the states is to eliminate public housing uh, and replace it with uh, mixed, mixed uh, income communities. Um, so Stateway Gardens is gone except for one building, uh, that, and it's, this is Wentworth Gardens. Um, these, are all, these are really big paintings for a lot of people. This is 13 feet long. It's 9 by 13 feet. So they're pretty good size. Um, <clears throat> this is Rockwell Gardens. Outgale Gardens. So and they all sort of painted as a, as a pastoral. Um, but you know, the, the public housing projects are not the idea of the pastoral people think of when they start <laughs> thinking of uh, garden spots. So, and there's all kinds of stuff going on that have to do with the imagery, but there's all kinds of things happening that have to do with the paint as a kind of, uh, where the paint has its own identity and it demonstrates its own function within the context of that whole picture. Um, and then this is uh, 
uh, Nickerson Gardens, which is not in Chicago, which is in <laughs> Watts in South Los Angeles, which is where my family moved to. We, I'm from Birmingham, Alabama, and it was interesting that poem of Elizabeth read uh, the Gwendolyn Brooks poem with the uh, just a plain black boy from uh, Alabama. <laughs> Uh, but we moved from, the Nick, from Birmingham, Alabama to the Nickerson Gardens projects in, in Watts. And that when my brother, my sister, and I, it was, there were three of us in the family at the time. And that was 1963. So the painting is called Watts 1963. But it's called Watts 1963 because of what it portends, the way in which everything that seemed so excessively uh, invested in beauty and pleasure uh, all that comes to an end in 1965 when the Watts riots breaks out. So that painting is sort of about what's, what's yet to come, how this is all disrupted in some way. Um, this is a painting called Pastimes. And that, this, this is another Chicago picture. You see the, in the distance there is actually Robert Taylor Holmes. And I don't know how many people know the infamous Robert Taylor Holmes uh, in in public housing history, um, because that Robert Taylor Holmes, uh, there was a, a survey the, in the poverty surveys that the United States did in terms of identifying the uh, poorest communities in the country. And I think it was 1996 or seven or so where they did a study on the poorest communities. Um, <clears throat> Of the, uh, of the uh, 11 poorest communities in the United States, seven of them were the Robert Taylor homes. <laughs> because it's a huge, I mean, that, you talk about a complex of, of housing projects, it was massive. And it, it linked up with Stateway Gardens. So it went from 35th Street in Chicago down to 55th Street. And it was, these buildings were sort of situated in this sort of alternating kind of Diagonal. They have thir uh, they're 16 floors a piece, these buildings. And they actually look like prison cell blocks more than they look like pl places where people are supposed to live. <laughs> but it was, it was interesting. So, and this is that, that scene. This is in Washington Park in Chicago, down near, uh, it's like on 55th Street, actually. So, near the University of Chicago, it's sort of that, that uh, vast. Uh, Parkland between the South Side and Hyde Park, you know, it's that. that. <clears throat> uh, then, so this is called ba Bang, Happy Fourth. Uh, it says Happy Fourth of July, Bang, and it's really about the ambivalence and desire. So that the way in which Black people in America are sort of stuck between these two revolutionary ideals, the ideal of liberty that America was supposed to be founded on, but founded on liberty while maintaining slavery for 200 years after <laughs> they signed it. <clears throat> and this whole notion that we are all one people, which is sort of never really applied to black people as in their position in America. So there's always been this contradiction. Uh, so that picture is sort of about them being sort of stuck in this place in between, <clears throat> and yet, sort of wanting to be as much a part of America, actually not even, not even wanting to be, but um, are entitled to be, actually, as much American as anybody else. Because there were, black people were here before the pilgrims got here. <laughs> you know, and so, but citizenship was denied to black people for uh, generations, um, even under the, the banner of freedom, equality, pursuit of happiness for all. So this, this tension sort of still exists, um, you know, remaining to be dealt with, sort of. Anyway, our town, you know, so all these pictures um, sort of speaks, and I, I hope most of the time the work speaks for itself in terms of not having to be explained, but just this, this notion of, <clears throat> You know, there are certain patterns of movement in, in that take place in countries where neighborhoods that were all white at one time become all black when black families start moving in. And so this sort of perfectly suburban kind of neighborhood, yeah, it's sort of now our town. <laughs> uh, 
Um, so anyway, and then along with that, there's a series of, of American sort of icons, Boy Scout. I'm going to go fast, so the focus puller is going to have to be quick. <laughs> Girl Scout. Cub Scout. <laughs> Brownie. <laughs> you know, it's that whole... <laughs> There's actually a scout master and a den mother, but I didn't put those in. <laughs> uh, and then there's, there's a group of paintings that have, uh, really take the 1960s, the civil rights movement and the black liberation struggle as a part of their theme. And they're all about commemoration um, and based on the, the kind of popular commemorative souvenirs that were produced when Robert, you know, when John Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, and Martin Luther King were killed, there were these commemorative sort of ashtrays and souvenirs and stuff made to, to commemorate them because they, were, they sort of represented all the hopes of the civil rights era. And after the assassination of all three of them, all those ideas seemed uh, to a lot of people to collapse. Fortunately, uh, in some ways, uh, Lyndon Johnson was hamstrung by uh, John Kennedy's uh, proposals. So he was sort of stuck in this position where, as he said, I have to f figure out a way to out Kennedy John Kennedy. Um, <clears throat> because if I don't sort of go on with those programs, you know, then it's like there's going to be a reaction against uh, me as a politician. So he didn't have any choice, actually, but to push through the Voting Rights Act, <laughs> the Great Society programs. He didn't have any choice, really, politically, because to not do that at the time, given Kennedy's assassination, would have been like political suicide. So, so anyway, so this, this, these works are kind of about that decade, about the 1960s, and the way the people who didn't receive the same popular commemoration that Kennedy and the, and Martin Luther, the two Kennedys and Martin Luther King did, but whose contribution to that decade were equally meaningful and in some cases more meaningful. And so across the top you have a pantheon of people who all, and the thing is, everybody in this group of paintings had to have died between 1959 and 1970, which are the decades that bracket the 60s. So, uh, but anyway, you have people who didn't get popular representation like uh, Malcolm X and Fred Hampton and Mark Clark, you know, who were Black Panthers who were killed in Chicago in 69. But you also have Meg Evers, you have Goodman, Schroeder, and Cheney in there. You had the four girls killed in the bo a church bombing at Birmingham, 16th Street Baptist Church. You have Viola Liuzzo, and you have Jimmy Lee Jackson. I mean, these are people who, if, when you go through the record, you see that there were a lot of people who were activists at the time uh, who were killed, but they didn't, they didn't represent the era like uh, the Kennedys and King did. And then you have uh, writers and uh, artists and other thinkers, you know, people like uh, Lorraine Hansberry, you have Zora Neale Hurston, you got Augusta Savage, W.B. Du Bois. Dorothy Dandridge, you know, all of these people who, these all people died, with, died within the decade of the 60s. Father Divine, who's in there, you know. And so all of these people, this is, these paintings are like Annunciation paintings. So they sort of call people to remember uh, these people. And then you have musicians. Uh, and in this painting you have all, of, these are all jazz, blues, and R&B musicians whose work really sort of shaped American culture, musical culture, uh, but all who died between 1959 and 1970. And that, those, the people who bracket that time are Billy Holiday, who died in 1959, and Jimi Hendrix, who died in 1970. And then you have these, all these people in between, John Coltrane, you know, Lil Walter, you know, Wes Montgomery, you got all these, Roy Hamilton, you got Nat King Cole, you got Dinah Washington. It's like all these people, you know, who died in that decade. If you make a list of those people, it's like it's such a it's a phenomenal list of people. Um, so, and these interiors, to go to the literal black interior, are all of these interiors. The first two are the living rooms of my wife's great aunts. Uh, and the first one, Ruth, who just died a year and a half ago at 92. Her sister, May, was the second one in color. She, she's still living. She's in her 80s. The third one before this was my mother-in-law's house. And this one is my mother-in-law's best friend's living room. 
And so, and I picked those places because of the way in which they are sort of in terms of the decor and a lot of things about those spaces, they are more reflective of, of, a, of a time past, like the 60s or 70s, than they would be of what people think of as sort of contemporary spaces. And so because the piece is sort of rooted in that history, it, it seemed appropriate to use those places as settings. Um, and then I'm, this is a close up, and so you see each one of the people who are represented in these paintings get to speak some, there's a roll call, then these people are named, and then each of those people get to speak somebody else's name. So that's Coltrane saying Roy Hamilton, <laughs> you know, Skip James over there, I mean, for those blues aficionados in the audience. <laughs> um, so, and then, and the, the other thing is like, in terms of modes of representation, uh, in this picture, you have all, again, I'm sort of still playing with these different modes of representation. So these are all sort of silk, photo silk screened uh, images. Um, so there's this combination of stylized images. There's a kind of realistic image. There's some gestural kind of marks. And then there are these photo silk screen images. So you sort of stack. There's a kind of hierarchy of real, uh, hierarchy of reality uh, in terms of modes of representation with the photographic being in some ways the most privileged sort of mode of representation now in terms of its, what people think of as its truth telling capacity. Um, and so the further away you move from the photographic, uh, the more subjectivity sort of seem, people think gets added on to the work because the artist's hands is some evidence of also the artist's sort of self kind of in there. There's no distance between what the art, who the artist is and his thinking and the thing that he represents with his hand. But in the photographic process, there's, a, there's this apparatus in between that's supposed to somehow uh, uh, <clears throat> sort of subdue uh, subjectivity when it comes to making images. But anyway, let me move on. Uh, and then there were five of these paintings that sort of reenact the original banner, which was the motivation for the whole project in the beginning. And it's that this We Mourn Our Lost uh, commemorative banner was ubiquitous during the 19, late 1960s, early 70s, after the assassination of those, those figures. And so, and it was one of these banners that made me want to make this series of paintings. And so you see that, paint, that banner in a lot of the pictures in the living room, but also I made five paintings on panel that reenact the same sort of uh, formal uh, strategy of those of those original banners, but they're they're all modified, and so and every one of these five are different, um, and so. And so there are other people's images because. Because the Kennedys and Kings, so they were they were on everything, and so I just sort of took the liberty of of imposing other people's presence on their presence because they are already their position is already secure. So these are on panel, and these are uh, three by four feet, four feet high, three feet wide. With glitter and acrylic. <laughs> and then I made a, a, that whole show, since it was about commemoration, I made a series of commemorative souvenirs. And this was a commemorative souvenir for the bombing at 16th Street Baptist Church. And so that is a vacuum formed plastic replica of a sign on the 16th Street Baptist Church made as a commemorative vase for putting plastic flowers and stuff. And it, it's part of an, on, this is like an ensemble. It's like this one constellation of things is all one piece, and it's called As Seen on TV. Uh, and then that, that same show had, these were a series of uh, sculptural objects that were made like giant rubber stamps. And those, the plates on the bottom of those stamps produce those prints that are on the wall. And I think the Walker has a collection of those prints in the collection here, too. 
And so in those prints were the, the dominant, the most popular slogans for the, during the 1960s for the, black, for the civil rights movement and the black liberation struggle. So it's the black power, uh, black is beautiful, black power, we shall overcome by enemies necessary and burn, baby, burn. That structure there, there's a video playing inside that structure, but we won't talk about that. And then there's, there's a series of photographs that also, it's all about the way in which this commemorative souvenir, so this is actually a, uh, an object. This is actually the, a letter opener top from an ink pen that was given out by a Ford dealership in Chicago in 1969 that my wife happened to have sort of in a box somewhere. And so I took, just made this photograph. So it looks kind of like a bullet or a rocket whichever way you want to go. Uh, but with Kennedy, the two Kennedys and Martin Luther King. So they was like, that's the holy trinity of the civil rights movement. And then the same thing, that photograph, um, this is a photograph of a photograph with photographs stuck in the corner of the frame. And so, for me, and that, that's again, the, the two Kennedys and King. But the photograph stuck in the side of the frame are pictures of every single person who was represented in all of the paintings that are a part of that group. Um, and then, now this is sort of a, a transitional kind of picture uh, that's from the last exhibition I had at the MCA in Chicago, it was now two years ago um, when that show opened. But the title of that show was One True Thing, Meditations on Black Aesthetics. And it was a way for me to look at every, look at, at almost every kind of manifestation of the idea of blackness that I could think of uh, under the idea of the black aesthetic. Um, <clears throat> and so everything in the show was about blackness in one form or another. And so this is a photograph I took of the, the Johnson's Publishing Building in Chicago uh, from Lakeshore Drive uh, at night so with the ebony and jet uh, sign on the top of the building lit. And so and it's, it, the title of the photograph is Black. Which, and so it's black on black on black, basically, because it's black night. <laughs> ebony is a black wood, and jet black is dark, super black. So it's, it's, all, it's all blackness. Uh, as a, and it's, it's blackness as a kind of um, uh, a conceptual kind of frame. Uh, and then in that show too, was, this is a triptych. So I'm gonna show this one, this one, and this one. There are three photographs that go together. It's part of a piece called Heirlooms and Accessories. Uh, and uh, how many people saw, there was a sh there's a show traveling around the country called Without Sanctuary. Anybody in here see that show? So I see one person in here. Uh, a couple of people back then. A couple. So that show is, it's an exhibition of, of uh, postcards, lynching uh, postcards that show uh, the part, some of the history of lynching in the United States. Uh, and it's, this is, uh, one of a relatively well-known, there's a well-known photograph of a double lynching that took place in Indiana. Uh, but the image of the lynching has been reduced and I've simply singled out three, of, three women who are standing in front looking at the camera. I mean, there are a lot of people looking at the camera, but these three women in particular uh, for me represent uh, the, the generations uh, and the way in which sort of heirlooms are passed down from generation to generation to generation. And so the piece as a whole, heirlooms and accessories, sort of takes the idea that, well, so what is an heirloom? An heirloom is a thing that you pass down. Uh, but an accessory is a thing that you wear. So these are like little lockets or amulets. Uh, but these people are also accessories to double murder. Uh, and they are all sort of, everybody's sort of standing there having their picture taken for the, and then somebody made a postcard of this, and this postcard sort of gets circulated uh, around the country. So, the thing, it's like the history of that kind of violence as represented in those photographs, that's the history, that's American history. And that's the legacy on which 
if a lot of people would say the wealth disparity between black people and white people in, the, in America is secured by that history. And so these, so none of those people who were, who were at any of those events were ever prosecuted for those crimes because it re was, really wasn't particularly a crime to kill uh, black people. Uh, due process didn't sort of figure into the whole equation uh, back then. <clears throat> but that people saw those events as kind of theater on some level, that there was a kind of an entertainment on another level. It's, that's, a, that's a part of a kind of a, a uh, that's, the, that's the legacy I'm wanting to expose in some kind of ways with a work like that. And so if you take those three women, uh, and this is, the this is the oldest woman, uh, the, this is the middle woman who's probably in her early 20s, and then this other girl is about 14 or so, with, she's there with her boyfriend. And so it's like, well, yeah, these people are gonna hand, they're gonna pass on to their children whatever the, the gains are that are sort of the result of of a legacy and a history of this kind of activity. So they're gonna pass this on to their children. Um, so that's what this piece is. So what the piece tries to do is to really embody the concept of the heirloom and the accessory. And so the frames and everything are, are a factor in here. So the frames of the rhinestones around the edge of the frame. So that makes the frame sort of like a jewel box in a way. And that, but you, if you were, you could barely see the image in the background where the, the two figures hanging there, but that's repeated over and over and over again. And in each picture, all I did was simply re hold the, uh, the resolution on the woman that I wanted to isolate and put in an amulet and then let everything else fade so that you foreground those figures and uh, you see that the backdrop, the haunting sort of backdrop is that other image. So, Anyway, we we'll go. Th I'll run back through those. I'm taking it too much. Huh? What part? What part? Oh, that's just the color bar you put next to a picture when you're taking a slide. <laughs> so the, if, somebody, if somebody wanted to print it, they could get color correction. <laughs> right. That's all. That's what that is. Oh, so, and then, so now I have this comics project uh, that I've been working on called Rhythm Master. Um, of which these, these are some drawings that have to do with that project. And they're this, I'm going to just show a sequence of five drawings, but the project is, a, is much larger. And these are all these are five drawings that all say the same thing, but it's, it's the same. It's this, this couple sort of seen from uh, four different views. So you sort of rotate around them. But the di in the dialogue balloon, it says, everything will be all right. I just know it will. Uh, <clears throat> which is a very comic book-like kind of thing to say. Um, and so you got these views. <laughs> and then that one with the boss. <laughs> um, all right, and then this is also a triptych. But since I don't have three projectors, I have to do them one at a time. So, and this is based on what people, the Ishihara test for colorblindness. Um, and it has to do with trying to find a way to embody the idea of blackness in a colorblind context. And it's based on a, a, a statement, a, a quote I read from a, a Greek philosopher, Plutonius, in which he just, which he sort of, talks about how <clears throat> uh, the mode of representation doesn't make any difference. Um, that in representing a black person, it doesn't really matter how you, rep how you show them. Uh, and he says, it doesn't matter whether you even use white chalk to do a drawing, that the accumulated uh, attributes of this person, the flat nose, the thick lips, the kinky hair, it says all of that stuff will add up and make a black effect on the thing represented. So that it kind of doesn't matter how, what way in which you see it, you will always know that it's, it's uh, black. And so I took this colorblind test and sort of if you had red green colorblindness, <laughs> Uh, this could be a problem for you to, to read. <laughs> but if you don't, it's easy to see. 
<clears throat> but the thing that it's sort of, it says FUBU in this one. Then it says Foucault. <laughs> and then it says motherfucker. <laughs> so if you say those things together, you have FUBU, Foucault, motherfucker. You know, it had, there's a kind of intonation <laughs> to that. <laughs> that has a kind of a black tonality to it. <laughs> and so that's why in, in a colorblind context like that, you can still read blackness. Uh, and then to go further, in this group, it's like to conjugate the, word, the verb to be in Ebonics, or black English. And so it's three panels, it's I be, you be, he be, she be, they, we be, they be, which is sort of a, a part of a kind of black linguistic sort of figure, speech pattern. In fact, it was, you know, say what, you say what they be doing, or we be going uh, places. <clears throat> uh, and then this was a, as a part of that, this, there was also this sort of romantic dimension to the whole idea of the black aesthetic. Um, in which this sort of notion of the black man as the, the, the original man, that black people were in some kind of, in an, in an Eden uh, before white people came to Africa, and all the, then all the problems sort of started. Uh, and so this is sort of kind of a, about the kind of fantasy of that Edenic uh, kind of origin. Um, and this is, but that, this is like a particularly urban kind of park <laughs> that this couple is running through, through a field of clover you know, against the tall grass. But that's in Washington Park in Chicago also. Uh, and then that's an installation shot in which in the background you see that sort of Donald Judd-like structure back there, which is called the Ladder of Success, which takes uh, uh, the, um, uh, a couple of things. And then this you can't read, but those are church signs, which have the names of black, in the black community, the black church is a small business enterprise. <laughs> and so there's more than a few. OK. I'm done. Uh, these are, and these are the current paintings. These are drawings of the paintings that I'm working on now. And so that's going to be. And that's on the cover of the book. So that's the end. <laughs> All right. I know I took way more time than I should have. Testing, test. Oh, it's very loud. All right. All right. So, okay. Oh, Elizabeth. <laughs> well, I had a thought. I have many <laughs> thoughts. I'm glad the mermaid is up for our backdrop. But I was thinking about how um, one of the things it seems to me that we're both interested in is where history meets nostalgia, right? Where memory meets nostalgia. Mm -hmm. So that history as such is interesting to us, but also the, I think, pull of nostalgia that's part of remembering and that I think is also part of making the work, mm -hmm. which to me in the pictures that we saw was most evident in the picture of the picture with all the pictures in the frame. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just that kind of accumulation, accumulation, accumulation of all mm -hmm. of the details of history as a memory mm -hmm. um, that can be crowding, but also I think are, uh, are profoundly beautiful and somehow lead to 
a way of thinking about the nostalgic as a way of somehow looking forward or imagining something unseen, imagining something that we're not yet in, mm -hmm. and not just recuperating mm -hmm. through nostalgia, not just saying, oh, uh, to be back in a time before mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z, mm -hmm. right? Oh, to be back in that decade. Oh, to be part of that movement. Mm -hmm. But rather, um, <coughs> what is ahead and how can this remembering help get us there even though we don't know what that looks like? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's interesting uh, because I, I went over to the soap factory, the soap plant today. <laughs> Which one is it? It's one of those. <laughs> And that was that Afrofuturist show there. And I mean, and it's, it's, I think it's really interesting when listening to some of the videos and some of the things that, and reading some of the things that people wrote in the Afrofuturist uh, show, this idea of, of sort of recuperating history in order to move ahead to the future is a theme that runs through that whole show. Mm -hmm. um, and, in a way, I think the, 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 a part of the reason for that is because I, I think as, a, as black people in America sort of have this sort of nagging sense um, on some level that we are rootless. <laughs> we are sort of historyless. We have no history, really, because it's the, the history that we have has been sort of severed on some level. Mm -hmm. And that if you can't sort of figure out where you stood before, there's almost no way you can really find out how to get from there to another place. And so I think a part of this, I think a lot of, of, of what happens in black product productivity, cultural productivity, has to do with this sort of reclamation. It's partly, it, it almost always has to start as partly a reclamation project. Mm -hmm. um, and in the, but, but the recuperation is not, a, as, as you were saying earlier, it's not an attempt it's, it's not really just a nostalgic attempt to sort of get back to uh, this Edenic time when things were all sort of supposed to be right. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it, it really seems to be like a fundamental need to be able to, to establish where you are, in a sense, to know that, it's on, it's, it's, it, that the ground that you're building, whatever this future you want to build on, is firm somehow. Because if it's not, then the future that you think you're trying to imagine is sort of, it's more tenuous than, it e than the present even seems to be for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and the thing is like you have to prove that you, you almost have to prove that you had a father mm. <laughs> and you had a mother, mm -hmm. that you didn't do like uh, Topsy in, uh, in, the, mm -hmm. in Uncle Tom's Cabin, I just growed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> And that, that sense of sort of just growing, that's what individuality represents. That indiv this sort of radical individuality that America seems to be organized around is based on the principle that people are just, people sort of came into being when they did, and that nothing else that happened behind them matters really. Mm -hmm. That's the sort of position that Ward Connolly or somebody would take, you know, would say Ew. that. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. It must action. be said. <laughs> yes, it must be said. But this is that's the fundamental sort of basis for the idea of colorblindness. That the past you had, the past you experienced, that that history doesn't really matter. That it's only the now that matters. And it's what potential you have to build for a future. But it still sort of remains that if you don't really know, if you don't have a, 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 an origin myth mm -hmm. to operate from, then you cannot really effectively imagine a thing called the future because you have nothing to judge it against, mm -hmm. really. But then what if you know, we thought about um, our generation right now, people who are making art right now, what would it mean to make, what would it mean to say, we're not worried about that anymore because what we are trying to do is, well, I don't really like posts so much, but I mean, in writing this long poem on the Amistad in the mm -hmm. new book, I was thinking about what would a post, 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 post African American history poem look like? Mm -hmm. A poem that didn't have to prove it had a father. A poem that could take someone like, you know, a Sanke, you know, a great and iconic hero, mm -hmm. the Amistad, a great and iconic story in our history, and approach it not so much with irreverence, mm -hmm. but enter it in a way that didn't have to first erect. Do you see what I mean? That didn't have to first retell and rebuild and monumentalize 
that history that has been so deliberately uh, uh, twisted and erased and evacuated. Um, and that seemed interesting to me as mm -hmm. kind of a challenge for us now, mm -hmm. is to think about, well, what is the space uh, of beyond? You know, that's, Michael Harper has a great line where he says, a friend told me he'd risen above jazz. I leave him there. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, by, to quote that, I mean, I don't mean to say, you know, leave the kinds of things we've been talking about behind, but on the other hand, I guess the question would be, um, what for you is post, 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 post? <laughs> well, I, mean, I, I don't know, maybe for me, um, this sort of post, 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 post is the ultimate sort of synthesis. And I, I keep using that word in almost everything I say. It's sort of this ultimate synthesis where, wherein uh, all things are present at all times. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not a, see, I, I, don't, I can't imagine, at least for me, I can't imagine a form right now uh, that doesn't uh, contain like all things that ever were. Mm -hmm. Um, and the thing is, like, if you can construct the thing that has those all things that ever were, then in the process of doing that, you actually end up creating this thing that never has yeah, been. That's true. That's and so, <clears throat> I think that's sort of, to me, that's the the, the that's post, 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 because mm -hmm. it's like the fact that you can, when you stack those posts next to each other, each one of those posts is marked by a set of conditions that are particular. Yeah. And so you have to have those particularities sort of in every one of those posts in order for the next post to, to it's like it can't, so it's not like, um, it's not, I don't believe in spontaneous combustion, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and that's sort of what that seems, to, mm -hmm. it seems to me at least, and I don't know if that's what you really mean. If you mean that it's a kind of, uh, of a, if it's a kind of self-generative thing that brings itself into being, but out of no sort of material, no prior material. Well, no, 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 no. I mean, that wouldn't existence. be. I don't. Either one of us would. It? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, so maybe you can explain a little bit. How how do you see it? The, well, the, the I mean, few... I guess you know, just to feel maybe maybe it's about in a way moving beyond the burden of representation, um, because I think that's a, of course a very very interesting um, pressure or challenge mm -hmm. that has. Uh, hung over many, many, many African-American creators. Um, this idea that we have to you know, represent the race or that we have to um, uphold or that we have to put forth something that is in some way positive. Um, and, you know, and I think that that's something that we both... See, except I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't qualify the positive as a characteristic of the thing that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, so, but I'll let you, you should go on yeah, with yeah. the way you were explaining that. But I, I, would, I would strip that from the, the model. You know, mm -hmm. Like I'm not interested in, uh, I'm not so interested in a sort of positive images sort of uh, paradigm. Mm -hmm. You know that's because I think that then sort of denies a certain levels of complexity. Of course, um, yeah. In which the grotesque within, I mean, there's it's like if you take humanity or sort of existence, I mean, there's the grotesque sort of within all of that too. And there are places, there are times when that kind of grotesque can be equally as captivating mm -hmm. and sort of necessary to come to terms with. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. What about beauty? What about, what about like this, you know I love this painting so, mm -hmm. so much. And what about, um, you know, like in American Sublime, there are a lot of different ways of th that that phrase plays out throughout the book, but one of them is about the pureness of a kind of a sublime beauty that mm -hmm. um, is found in blackness. Mm -hmm. um, but, in, but before we go mm -hmm. on with that, can, let's mm -hmm. go back to because um, I want I actually want to hear um, some more of your your uh, ideas about this kind of post 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 post, and especially sort of given the when in the poems you read, mm -hmm. I mean I could see the same kinds of sort of reclamations, the same kinds of sort of acknowledgments, mm -hmm. the same kinds of, of of um, mythologizing. I can see, I hear it in your mm -hmm. poems. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, so when you ask me what this sort of post, post, post that doesn't have to reclaim, yeah. that doesn't have to mark its relationship to the past, that doesn't have to really establish that kind of uh, 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 
need to represent mm -hmm. because you, you do represent. Yes, I do. <laughs> and yeah. so, <laughs> and I, I hope I, I want to see. And I hope that I do it not because I should, <laughs> right? Not because um, it is somehow the right thing to do, but more because in what is represented, I find, you know, absolute fascination, richness, um, uh, complicatedness, beauty. Uh, mm -hmm. A necessity to tell those stories. Right. It's not about saying you must pass through these stations before you've sort of earned the right to speak out of your own place and time. That that is a way of speaking out of place and time, and of just you know beginning to tap into the inexhaustible resources that are to just take one example in our history writ large and also in our individual community and family histories. I mean, we couldn't even begin to touch all of that. Mm -hmm. um, there's so very much, and as it happens, it's also underrepresented. Mm -hmm. So in, in some ways, I mean, I think that's the blessing of uh, being in the right place in the right time with the right perspective, that the material feels, to me, um, infinite. Uh, I can imagine getting stuck in certain ways. Um, I can't imagine finding myself without material as such, mm -hmm. you see? But if you, if, if you imagine yourself being stuck, I mean, see, because the question I wanted to ask is, well, how do you tell the difference? How do you know the difference between this sort of obligation mm -hmm. to represent, as you described, and this sort of free uh, position in which you just represent because that's what you... Yeah. I mean, I think... is there, do, you, do you recognize that difference in, in your own productivity? I mean, do you, which, where are you working from, and how do you tell... Yeah. when this sort of creeping obligation is starting to impose itself mm -hmm. Well, you know, you. I love Césaire, too. Um, and The Notebook was a very important poem to me as well. And I think that um, in the last two books, in Annabellum Dream Book, the poems that came out of the dream space. Mm -hmm. um, and then in this book, the Ars Poeticas, which are, it's a whole long section that are, it, 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 they're quite analogous or are, are sort of a, the next stage of, I think, the dream poems because the writing of them felt... Um, unusually free associative, um, mm -hmm. surreal in moments in the way that dreamscapes are, but at the same time, not at all separate from history, politics, mm -hmm. uh, race, <laughs> gender, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. identity. Um, and that was the fascinating discovery for me, mm -hmm. that even when operating in, you know, in the muck, in the subterranean place, in the, mm -hmm. in the, dream, in the dreamscape, mm -hmm. um, that still there, uh, there is all of this material. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe that's a part of the sort of how do you know, um, which is sometimes literally checked in dreams. Um, because after all, you know, you're not responsible for you can't control what happens in your dreams. Um, can you? <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. They, actually, they do say sometimes you can put something on your mind before you go mm -hmm. to bed, and then maybe you'll get a dream <laughs> in the morning that will show you the way. Um, but that, that is unguarded space, um, that, that's, that that's not social space, um, the space where we dream. So maybe that's sort of hmm. part of it. Um, well, see, that's, I, I, I guess I don't, I, I don't have, maybe I don't have the capacity to separate those things into... Uh, compartments mm -hmm. like that. Because it, to me, it seems like a part of that thing that I was describing as the always, it's, it's the everything all at once mm -hmm. kind of thing. So there's no place else mm -hmm. other than that. Mm -hmm. So, and, and it's, it, it's sort of determined in some ways by a certain sense of obligation, which one can, it's, can't escape, mm -hmm. I think. But it's also uh, just simply uh, being the condition of the condition of sort of only of sort of really knowing only this. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is sort of the existence you know, mm -hmm. the information you've read is the history you've learned, the experiences mm -hmm. you see are the ones you have, mm -hmm. and all of those things somehow link up mm -hmm. with the social, the historical, the political, the social, the cultural. It's mm -hmm. like they all link all the time, and you you sort of can't you can't stop that mm -hmm. in a way because I mean. You, you have two modes of address, you know, at least in terms of uh, material production. Mm -hmm. You have your poetry, and then you have your essays, mm -hmm. voice. Now, I don't see a vast difference mm -hmm. between the voice of the essayist, Elizabeth, and the voice of the poet, Elizabeth. Because I, I find in your poetry, I mean, as much analysis 
in the poetry as I find in the essays. It may be a little more, um, uh, what's the, it's a little more economical, mm -hmm. maybe, mm -hmm. let's say, in the poetry mm -hmm. than it is in the essay because that's a longer form when mm -hmm. you sort of get to uh, talk about. But I still, I see those, I see you speak in the same mm. voice in both of those terms. Do you, do you see a difference between the way you speak as an essayist and the way you speak as a poet? Is the poetry more dreamscape-like stuff or, and the, the essay more concrete in some kind of way or something? I don't well, I mean, I do think that um, in some ways they come from similar places because, I mean, you're right. I mean, I do feel like there is analysis if you chose to look at it that way in the poems. Maybe what the poems have more of is, you know, a reliance on the image, um, mm -hmm. a, a luxuriating in language in a different way, although the essays are, I think, pretty clearly essays written by a poet in that they are mm -hmm. um, uh, rather distilled and that while they have arguments, they're not conventionally argued. Mm -hmm. um, they, their arguments work according to uh, poetic logic, I think, um, even if they are a poetic logic that I hope the reader is easily able to follow. Mm -hmm. um, they, I find that they, the working on them happens differently in life. You know, poems are something that never leaves me. Poems are something that I can do in the middle of the night. Poems are something I can do when everything else is happening. Poems are something that call me very, very urgently. Um, essays just take more hours of stretches. You know, I, I can't quite fit them in, in, in little cracks mm -hmm. in the way that I often uh, mm -hmm. must with all the other components of life. So the writing of them um, is a bit different. Mm -hmm. um, and also the writing of them is, um, what is it? It's a little more, I just like I want to just make make the my hands on either side of my brain, you know. Just like they take my brain laterally, and the poems <laughs> move all over the place um, in a way that's less discernible to me when I'm doing them. I to you suppose, while you're doing it. To me so. <laughs> while I'm doing them, um, but also as far as representing goes, you know, there's another um, part of my life which is being a teacher, and that's where I feel like I um, am sort of answering the colored elders. <laughs> by, by doing a good job as a teacher. Uh -huh. um, and then in a way that sort of frees me up for all kinds of other things. It's mm -hmm. funny, isn't it? But that's... Yeah, because I, 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 I'm, I still don't see the... Dis I, can't, I don't make the distinction yeah. just yeah. From, because I, I'm not with you 24-7. So yeah. <laughs> I guess what I see mm -hmm. seems consistent. Mm -hmm. But I, think it, I don't think it's... it's I think it mm -hmm. is consistent. Mm -hmm. I think it is consistent. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so what about like beauty? What about just um, um, sheer and pure and powerful and um, ravenous black beauty in your work? Well, I mean, in a way, I think I strive for it. Mm -hmm. And I, for me, I think those, those black figures I paint mm -hmm. are, I would, I would say for me, they are sublimely beautiful. Yes. Um, and the, and in, in the sense that they have what uh, beauty is, what that kind of sublime beauty is supposed to have is it's this terrifying aspect mm. too. And so it's, it's, it's that two thing, that two-ness, mm -hmm. that double sort of quality where, and the thing is like um, that kind of blackness that I'm representing in the pictures, I mean, I find it extremely uh, powerful and sort of, and beautiful mm -hmm. to behold, um, but I, and when I see that same kind of blackness in a real person, mm -hmm. it is also, it's miraculous mm. in a way because you just don't encounter it often. Mm -hmm. But when you do, mm -hmm. it is such a phenomenon, yes. you know, that it, it's just mesmerizing mm -hmm. in some level. Mm -hmm. And so, and the thing is, I know that the idea of, the very idea of blackness uh, in the American context is not associated with beauty uh, in the sense that we, we think of beauty, of the beautiful. Mm -hmm. And what most people think of as the beautiful is prettiness, mm -hmm. you know, basically. And prettiness and beauty are two different things. And I think the, pr the beauty doesn't really function unless it has that, also that terrifying mm -hmm. dimension to it. And it's sort of like, uh, like uh, uh, there was a, this artist, sort of John Graham, I don't know, 
Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. who <clears throat> did, wrote a book called Systems and Dialectics of Art, in which he sort of tried to answer all these questions that were relevant to the idea of, of art. And he asked, him, asked in that dialectic what, uh, what was beauty. Mm -hmm. And his philosophical sort of turn was that beauty is the beautiful taken to the verge of ugliness. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's that terif that's where that terrifying aspect sort of comes in to the whole thing. And so what I try to uh, preserve in the work that it, I mean, because these, these images are carefully constructed, mm -hmm. and I massage those tones, you know, so that they are as deep as I can get them, mm -hmm. you know, with, with detail inside, mm -hmm. but not so much detail as to turn the lights up too much mm -hmm. to make it realistic mm -hmm. in terms of its representation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because I, I, it's that way in which you're drawn into it that sort of matters a lot to me. And mm -hmm. so that's one beautiful aspect in terms of the image. Mm -hmm. And then the paint itself. I mean, when I make a painting, I'm trying to make the surface of that painting, you know, the mark that comprises it. And so I'm trying to make that really as attractive. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I want to like it. <laughs> Yeah. I want to like the way that mark looks too. And so I'm, I'm invested in all of those levels of thinking about the attractiveness of the painting as an object mm -hmm. and then the attractiveness or the power of the image as, as you know, an emblem or, or something. So mm -hmm. I'm... Oh, go ahead. So anyway, so that's, yeah, that's, that's how I think about uh, beauty. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's that sort of beauty with a terrifying aspect. Yeah, so. yeah. Did um, Tanner's Annunciation, is that a painting that's been important to you? I, I was thinking about it in terms of um, what you were saying about ambition, and I've never seen the painting in person. It feels to me like it would be a huge painting, but I don't know if, in fact, it mm -hmm. is. Yeah, and I, I don't know if it's, I don't think it's that big. Mm -hmm. and I, I don't think I've ever seen it mm -hmm. in person. I mean, the, the Tanners I've been able to see were the ones they had at the, they had one at the LA County Art Museum, they have one at the Art Institute. So I've seen those, and then some other smaller, you know, the more modest mm -hmm. kinds of things. But not that one in particular, uh, but just the, the genre of Annunciation paintings in particular, mm -hmm. in general, I would say, was, that was a, uh, those were things that, the term, that was a, strat, a, a sort of a formal model for those, uh, the, the uh, 60s, uh, civil rights paintings. Oh. So using the Annunciation as a device for calling people to witness or mm -hmm. calling people to know something or mm -hmm. to remember something. Mm -hmm. And so that's why in, the, in each of those paintings there's a, an angelic figure in each of those paintings, you know, mm -hmm. because that's the angel of the Annunciation so, sort of calls people to know, mm -hmm. to come to know mm -hmm. things. Um, <clears throat> but Tanner, um, I mean Tanner is sort of an, an is, a, is an interesting figure, I think, for his uh, usefulness in terms of the way I started out as an, as an African-American artist, sort of looking for models yeah. uh, to base my work on. And he didn't figure too prominently uh, in my development, um, and in, in part because I didn't really connect with this subject matter. You know, not only am I not sort of, I mean, I'm, I say I'm not particularly invested in Christian subject matter uh, on the one hand, you know, um, but I was also not particularly uh, invested in his use of white figure representation in his narrative images. Mm -hmm. And I understand the reason why, and, and these all have political implications too, that the reason why Tanner would use uh, that white figure representation is because there was no market for the image of black presence in those kinds of pictures, you know. Um, and so if, and for him, you know, as an artist who wants to do what a lot of artists sort of saw themselves as doing, is sort of relieving themselves of the burden to represent mm -hmm. um, by not having the black figure presence in their work, mm -hmm. you know, because that would tend to pigeonhole what they did into a, a dismissible, a narrow and dismissible category. They avoided using black figures as often as possible. Now, he did do paintings that had black figures in them, but they tended to be, you know, the sort of uh, overtly sentimental mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, kinds of images um, that might have had some popularity at the time, but 
didn't really live that long, mm -hmm. I think, in the, in the interests of generations of people who came after him. Mm -hmm. um, but I, in terms of my larger mission, uh, I, I think it's important for there to be this sort of black figure representation in these museums. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's more important for that to be in the museums to me now than it is for anything that somebody might call good painting to be in the museum. Mm -hmm. Because there's no shortage of sort of good works to be, that can be shown. Mm -hmm. But there is a shortage of black figure representation in the museums. And so as I was telling somebody earlier <clears throat> that you can, you can go into most museums and walk through the history of art from the 15th century, 16th century, 17th century, 18th century, and you would, not, you would get the impression that black people didn't start making work until the 19th or 20th century. Um, and that's, I don't like that. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. So mm -hmm. I think <clears throat> when I do work that sort of borrows from some of these sort of historical traditions, it's a way of sort of retrofitting into those, those uh, period models. Mm -hmm the image in a way that I've controlled it, mm -hmm. you know, or that a black person has controlled it, as opposed to those images being peripheral mm -hmm. to the narrative that's been told. Mm -hmm. I think that's more important to me than anything else. Mm -hmm. um, because, like, you know, what's good, really? I mean, who's gonna, who is deciding that? Yeah. And that's, a, that's really important. Who is deciding what's good? Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's not me, <laughs> then I'm suspe suspicious. <laughs> and so, on the one hand, so that's the same kind of thing. What about but, the present moment? Well, with other painters, though, I mean, um, for, for example, in African American poetry, this is an incredible time that we're in um, as far as, I mean, of course, you know, black people have been writing amazing poetry forever and a day, but what's happening now that's very nice is that we're seeing much more publication. Um, we're, we're, we're infiltrating in a very mm -hmm. wonderful and visible <laughs> and tangible way. May it multiply and uh, last, we, we shall see. Um, but so I wonder also if you see this, and then that, that, that other things build on that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, institutions devoted to black poetry mean that more, uh, more poetry is made, more people know each other, more people can find their way mm -hmm. into the institutions and so forth and so on. What, how would you describe this moment in, in African American painting specifically? Or art making, it doesn't just have to be mm -hmm. painting, but <coughs> painting would actually be an interesting mm -hmm. example. Um, well, I mean, there, there are similar sort of impulses to what you describe in, in poetry, in, in letters. You know? And the thing is, like, we, we know that um, in African American letters has always had a kind of tradition, an institutionalized tradition uh, within the culture, I mean, because that's sort of a sign of education mm -hmm. in a way. And so you, you, have, uh, you have a lineage of poets that you can look to who have, I think, in some ways, a very prominent sort of place in the history of American letters. I mean, there, there are more people in that realm, I think, that have a prominent place in the history of, of letters than perhaps in the, in the visual arts. Um, but the, the, see, I don't think that, I don't see in, in African American visual arts right now a whole lot of difference, uh, or what people call a whole lot of progress. Mm -hmm. um, and I say that only because like, there have been periods in the history of, of in, in history in which in America, there have been African American artists who have achieved a certain amount of, of um, recognition in their time. Um, and you could take that from people like uh, Duncanson mm -hmm. and Bannister, who at their time uh, in the 19th century were receiving honors and awards for doing the work they were doing. Uh, and then you move into the period that we call the Harlem Renaissance, where there, were, there was not only writers you know, like Langston Hughes and Claude McKay and all those people who started becoming prominent, but there were painters like Aaron Douglas and uh, Hale Woodruff and all those people who were sort of becoming prominent in the visual arts. And they were getting support from the foundations and you know, they were being written about you know, by people like James Porter and mm -hmm. people like Elaine Locke. So they were sort of in, there was a mix uh, there. <clears throat> but, the, but what ended up happening 
<laughs> is that it's like you could pick up a book on the Harlem Renaissance, which would be about that big. <laughs> mm -hmm. But if you pick up a book of American art history, you won't find any of those people <laughs> yeah. in the book on American art history. So that the prominence they had during the Harlem Renaissance seemed to not carry over mm -hmm. in any kind of sustainable way to the mainstream of art history. Well, and part of that is because the economic system that supports the arts um, <clears throat> requires different kinds of investment and a different sort of pool of investors than I think is, might be required in terms of literary mm -hmm. uh, production. Uh, literature could be much more widely dis distributed, so more people can know about it mm -hmm. uh, at a, a, a single word than can know about a single picture mm -hmm. sometimes. And because black people in general, in general don't have the kind of capital uh, base to make the art world as an institution more viable than it is, I think there's no real capacity for a sustained uh, institutional development uh, within black visual arts production um, for, uh, until you have a critical mass of black people who have the discretionary capital mm -hmm. to put into something like art you know, and build institutions that are equivalent to the Walker. You know, and not just one, but many, you know, so that black artists can operate independent mm -hmm. of the need to be a part of these institutions. Mm -hmm. um, not that you don't want to be a part of these institutions, but you need an, al you need an alternative that is equally as strong mm -hmm. to, pr to nourish and produce a developing generation of other artists. They, because artists need support, mm -hmm. just like writers need support. So, you know, it's, I don't know, it's, that's, that's sort of yeah. the way I see it. I don't know if it, if, I mean, you see a lot of African-American artists now showing work. Mm -hmm. If you're like Glenn Ligon, you get Kara Walker, you got a number of people who are showing work now, but this, it's that foundation thing. That foundation on which they are standing is so fragile, it's so flimsy, uh, that when that, it, that there's no, that there isn't a black market underneath that work to sustain it at the levels that it needs to be sustained in order for those artists to, to grow and develop further, mm -hmm. uh, to be really, really independent. Yeah. So, I know, that's sort of how I see it. But it's like, uh, I mean, if I, even, but even in letters, I would wonder, I mean, uh, because I remember reading uh, in, this, this Adam Lively is a British writer, I think, has a book called Masks uh, on the, his, uh, modernism, blackness, and the idea of race and blackness and modernism. Mm -hmm. And I, I read this really, uh, I mean, it's like painful sort of passage on the relationship between Charlotte, um, uh, what's her name? Grimke? No, the woman who was supporting uh, Langston Hughes. And oh, God, Ar Osgood Mason. Yes. Yeah, Charlotte Mason. Terrible story, yeah. <clears throat> right, I mean, it's like the, mm -hmm. to, to hear her talking about the kind, I mean, the way, she, the way they were sort of shaping the kind of work that people during the Harlem Renaissance were writing. And it was all determined by whether they could get support from mm -hmm. her or not. And it's like Langston Hughes sort of begging, <laughs> like, I'll do anything you want, just don't cut off the funds. That's right. <laughs> kind of thing. So And Zora Neale Hurston And as Zora well. Neale Hurston too, right. And so it's like she kept their uh, their copy the originals of their work in, in her safe. <clears throat> and there's a famous story about how she sent Zora a tropical flower dress and a straw hat <laughs> because that was the mode in which she saw that you know that was the role that she wanted Zora Neale Hurston to play. Right. That was what she wanted her to explore in her writing, which is, I think, um, it, part of the, the, the reason that we've all but forgotten that Zora Neale Hurston was an advanced graduate student in anthropology. In anthropology, when, you know, when women of color were the subject of anthropology, mm -hmm. she was one of three black women, one of them being Catherine Dunham, of mm -hmm. course, mm -hmm. studying anthropology at the graduate level. 
1930, um, when she studied with Franz Boas in, uh, in Colombia. But she, too, I think, would be seen as someone who, you know, just grew, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> who just emerged from the swamp in her flower dress and her straw hat um, with an ear uh, for um, the witty ways of the folk. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, anyway, th those were... But I was, yeah, I was sort of leading, that was sort of leading to this, this question about your perception as a writer, I mean, and a, and a poet in particular, um, about the, the, the independence. Well, actually, I have another thing in terms, and it, it goes, I guess, a little bit to this idea you were talking about, about the post, 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 post. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, it's like in, in the future of black writing, and sort of radical, independent black writing uh, that does the same kinds of things that people attribute to writers like James Joyce. You know, it's like the use of the way language is sort of reinvented mm -hmm. in some levels. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you think about the future of black writing, mm -hmm. I mean, do you, are you, do you imagine a kind of writing that a, aims at that kind of sort of radical reformulation of language, um, where it's, it's like in, in poetry, it's like, well, we've come, become used to certain kinds of conventions in poetry. Mm -hmm. And even what, and, and I don't know if we have an idea of what's radical poetry nowadays, mm -hmm. because it seems like is that the period for the radical seems to be post. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like we're post-radical. So is there, a, do you see, do you imagine a possibility for a new kind of radical poetry? And does that, does the radical kind of poetry you imagine have, um, a, is there a possibility to have a radical poetry with a peculiarly black mm -hmm. uh, intonation or yeah. linguistic figure? That's really interesting to me because, you see, I think we already have it. Um, and I have been thinking a lot about um, uh, and trying to start writing well, about, <laughs> a, you know, about a project that would, that would define, not even redefine, <laughs> that would define the experimental in black poetry. Mm -hmm. Because I think that now there are a few black poets who might be called experimental, mm -hmm. but only in the terms of, let's say, language poetry or other uh, um, uh, predominantly Anglo-American uh, avant-garde movements. Instead of looking back at someone like a Langston Hughes, for example, I mean, now he's such a canonized poet and his way of writing is, you know, it's just, it's like drinking water. I mean, we know mm -hmm. those poems and we know what those poems look like. Mm -hmm. But to remember that when Langston Hughes brought jazz and the blues into poetic form, mm -hmm. right, that jazz and the blues were new musics. Right, that, 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 that he was, that that was profoundly cracking open what the English language in poetic space could do. Mm -hmm. And that he wasn't in fact trying to recreate jazz and the blues in poetic form. He was trying to let it in and then make literary documents mm -hmm. that breathed in a different way with the music. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at someone like Gene Toomer, uh, who, you know, we, um, his book Cain is a remarkable book. And I think that you know, there you see him working in poetry, working in prose, trying to make new forms with which to represent this mm -hmm. uh, steeped, uh, powerful, uh, southern black reality that he was mm -hmm. trying to capture in poetic terms that were unique, that were new. Mm -hmm. And then later on, um, he did very important work that was, you know, as he himself was questing towards thinking about racial identity uh, that was uh, somehow transcendent. Um, and by the way, he wasn't just looking for racial identity that was transcendent, but I mean, he wanted to transcend gender, he wanted to transcend region, he wanted to transcend the body altogether. Mm -hmm. That he would, that that quest would be mirrored in what he did in poetry, and this is in the 1920s and 30s. Mm -hmm. um, and we could even go back further and make similar arguments for um, the radicalness of a Paul Lawrence Dunbar. Mm -hmm. uh, working in his two modes uh, uh, of trying to do something beyond simply um, humor and pathos with, uh, with dialect poetry, mm -hmm. right? And having that rub up against what he was doing in his poems that were in uh, received English forms. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I really think that, that, that what is called experimental 
has pretty much been denied to us. We haven't been given credit for that genius. Mm -hmm. um, so I would first start by going back mm -hmm. and saying, you know, what, where has and how has that genius occurred? Um, because it's, it's really a pretty remarkable tradition in those terms. Mm -hmm. And that would be the first conversation to have then in thinking about, I mean, which takes us back to where we started, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, we're, we're Sankofa birds. We're <laughs> looking back to look forward, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. you know, before mm -hmm. um, uh, and, 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 and marking the ground. I think maybe it's time for questions. Maybe we can. We have yeah. microphones what? for those of you who have questions. <laughs> First of all, I want to thank you for visiting Afrofuturism. I'm the curator of that show. And, um, all right. Congratulations <laughs> to you. Thank you. And um, I'd like to ask you whether or not there can actually ever be a post, post, post without a revision of art history. Because post implies that there's a point of departure. Mm -hmm. And so how do you get to um, post, 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 without that revision. I don't think you can. <laughs> no, I, that's what I was saying. I think you have to, you have to, you have to establish your location yeah. <laughs> first, and then you can imagine a variety of different things from that position. Because I, I think the, I mean, I'm not, I'm, I don't have a problem with fixed positions mm -hmm. actually. Because you can always you can move from fixed positions, mm -hmm. you know. But if you sort of don't know where you are, you know, you you're just sort of wandering, mm -hmm. and aimlessly. I mean, and it's sort of it's as undirected. So I'm all for sort of planning yourself here, and defining that space, and then looking out from there and saying, okay, let's try this, <laughs> let's go there, let's do this. So I don't think you can get to any of those post posts posts without anchoring yourself first, you know, and then going out from there. Because, it's, because I think it, it's all about self-consciousness. You know, and the more self-conscious you are about what you're doing, the more mobility you have. And I think that, that as an individual artist, I think that can be very helpful in helping them move on. But how do we help the public? How do we make institutions more responsive? I've seen a million pictures of the birth of the New York School uh, where Robert Motherwell and all the folks are sitting around the table. And nobody asks, who's that black guy sitting there that Robert Motherwell invited? Nobody knows who Norman Lewis is mm -hmm. while the rest of them have been canonized. How do we make institutions be responsive to that? It's not his work. His work, like you say, was winning awards in its time. Um, and it's representative represented a lot of major institutions like the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but the general public has absolutely no idea who he is. Well, don't you think, I mean, if I could just jump in that part of, um, part of the way to address it I've come to think is by making work and doing work. Because, you know, the corrective impulse will not only take us to the grave, but put us in the grave. <laughs> I mean, really, that can kill you. That kills people. Mm -hmm. That That's kills true. people when you realize you spent years of your life trying to explain and people are letting you go on and take that time and take that precious energy that could be used for making your work. And then at the end they still say, huh? You know, what, what are you being a little too sensitive? Well, what do you mean? So I, I don't know. I find myself now feeling like, you know, d doing this work and process through making work is the most important thing. And also, incidentally, there's um, going to be a, a great and important show at the Studio Museum in Harlem in the spring, Kelly Jones's show on um, black abstraction, that where Norman Lewis is obviously going to be a very important uh, uh, figure. And I, th I think that that show is really going to be an eye-opener um, uh, and, 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 and important. And I, I, imagine, well, I don't know if it'll tour, but maybe it will. Well, the other part of that, I mean, it, it goes to something I think I said earlier, because I, I agree with Elizabeth that, yes, you can, you can drive yourself to drink, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. if you're trying to fix a, this, this, a problem that we sort of perceive. I mean, there are some problems that, are, that just require way too much energy, energy to, to really get them resolved. And so on some level, you can kind of only do the part that you can do uh, but the but it still is the key is the, the the 
the, fund, the basic problem is an absence of parallel institutions of equal stature and standing that can project those ideas and artists into the public's view uh, with the kind of authority that the Walker can, or the Metropolitan can, or the Museum of Modern Art can. Those places as institutions have an almost unsurmountable, insurmountable stature. And so we're, in, we're sort of in a double bind here, where, yes, you, there's frustration you know, at the sort of continued sort of uh, uh, erasure, you could say, of people from the record who ought to be considered for it. Um, but that wouldn't be a problem, really. <laughs> you know, if, if we thought the studio, it's like the studio museum is, in some ways, it's like almost the only game in town, <laughs> you know, for a nation of people. Yeah. Like the, the studio museum is the place we look to. That's our Valhalla, <laughs> in a way. And so, and if when you only got one <laughs> Valhalla, you just, you know, and it can't do it all by itself. And so it's like we got to figure out ways. And and it's sort of now maybe more the the the, the chance is more likely now than ever before since there. So many more kind of there, there are a lot of black investment bankers now, <laughs> you know, um, who, you know, if they can be convinced <laughs> to spend some of that money on think tank building for one thing, meaning supporting institutions that <laughs> give back no return uh, but need large amounts of resource. You know, and that's like a poetry institute and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, the, but it's like this is what this is what institutions like um, the Walker and stuff do. They absorb large amounts of resources, mm -hmm. but they give back nothing practical to the people who put their money into it, uh, except prestige. You know, and we if, when you don't have a system of institutions like that that can deliver that kind of prestige uh, that make people want to put their money into it as, as instead of sort of Dick Parsons giving like his million dollars to the Museum of Modern Art. <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, they don't need his million dollars because there are people lined up to give them a million dollars. <laughs> so how come, there aren't, how come there's no place for people like him to put that kind of money that makes them feel good about putting their money there? You know, without that, Norma Lewis is going to be on the periphery for a long time. <laughs> Are there other questions? Hanging in effigy, a uh, figure of the Viking football player Randy Moss, who had recently been traded, the, the effigy was seen and then when people who were interested in its implications ran to see it, it had uh, been taken down and it's never actually been seen again. But it was actually uh, a lynching that was again witnessed and now denied or at least presented in a way that is perhaps even humorous, but a total ignorance of the history, for example, in this state, in Duluth, where we hung black people, you know, much like in Sanctuary, you know, with postcard images. But I wanted just to bring that up because it reflects, for me anyway, the metaphor of your work, that is, the denial of this history, you know, in the minds of good old Minnesotans as we go to our fair, you know. <clears throat> yeah, those are the things that uh, Cornell West would say are the things that one cannot not know. Mm -hmm. That's a good phrase. Well, in the interest of time, I think we should say thank you very much. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.